Remembrance Day uh, for his scholarship. I mean, when he got his doctorate. Uh, and uh, I make him very proud. Also, my father was here. Of course, when they came here, they came in a wonderful entourage and, <laughs> and they were catered well. Uh, and I had to look for that thing to do.
Stick hungry babies under our noses. Even your lions have no teeth in the sunshine. But at night, you throw the ugly out, put the young and restless in their beds, and switch on all the lights in your squares and palaces. Then policemen bounce up on the stage and sing like whistles. Imperial guards play saxophone in natty suits. And parents rush off with a little kiss to the Romanians or Hamlet in Amharic. Then on to Zebra for a drink, or is it dictated? Where the swizzle sticks are made of gold. And gunfights crackle like the gangsters in a poster at Raspailu's cinema. And somewhere in the shadows of this banquet, where tables groan with meat and fish, my mother is swishing her lovely ball gown. She has spent the afternoon back combing her hair into a fairy tale, stiffening it with puffs of elmet, sliding her warm bosoms into the tipsy balcony so she can dote on my father's arm just out of sight, and he will stand there stiffly, being But it's my great pleasure to, to uh, help kick this off, is to uh, welcome uh, Aida Eda Maria, who uh, uh, is uh, many things, including a, a graduate of, of, of Oxford, uh, but also a, a lead writer in, in The Guardian, and has uh, recently had a, a wonderful uh, kind of documentary memoir, novel, this is uh, this book which was published earlier this year is is the story of my grandmother um, who was born in Gonda um, and she lived for nearly a hundred years um, and that was a hundred years in which, as you will all know, um, it was one of you know the hundred years in which Ethiopia changed almost the most that it changed in its entire history. So in some ways, it's kind of a the reason why it's called personal history is because it's um, it's one woman's very partial, very subjective view of how you know she was born under the and, um, and then she you know and she died in 2013. So that you know just, she saw a great deal. Um, what I thought I would do is because of the theme of this. Um, I'm just looking at the clock, so I'm just trying to work out exactly how I'm going to organise it. Um, I thought she, she encountered the emperor a few times uh, in her life. Um, the reason, so she was born in Gondola and she was married to a priest who became an alika of, um, of Ba'aka church in Gondola. And um, he was, for complicated reasons that I, to be honest, is very hard to get to the bottom of, um, he ended his life in prison. Um, and having spent most of her life um, until that point, and she was in her early 30s, she, um, having spent at home, having, you know, she had 10 pregnancies, seven came to, um, seven grew up, uh, which is pretty good odds given the time. Um, and uh, having spent most of her time at home, raising a family, uh, you know, um, organising their home, she found herself going to Addis Ababa to petition for her husband's release, which is an interesting job to have to make. So the first bit that I want to read is about her first, um, her first arrival. Um, let me know if you can't, is it, can you hear me? Yes. 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 <laughs> in that country and in that time, when every thoroughfare still had its litigants, bringing earnest complaint before a curbstone judge, often appointed on the spot for the purpose, where the ability to argue brilliantly for oneself in court was more respected than business acumen or craftsmanship or musicality, where justice was held so dear that most would countenance a lifetime of court appearances, rather than feel it left undone, there everyone, however humble, had the right to bring his or her case before higher and higher courts, and eventually, if necessary, 
necessary before the emperor, the final arbiter between them and God. And so each morning she set off for the high court, accompanied by a kindly lieutenant who it was said might have been a general had he not displeased his superiors. She was staying with another army man and relative of her husband's, an old Gurdjami commander. Bashad and Lega and his wife could not have been kinder, providing advice, a bed for Adamarian when he visited from morning to do it my dad. <laughs> Bashad in. What the room looked like, who was there, apart from him, of course. He was standing before his throne. She bowed deep. He was king of kings, elect of God. But as she had sometimes tried to remember, remind herself over the long months, human too, with his own sadnesses. Lord Raskasa, who had been at the Empress side for 40 years, advising, <coughs> offering steadfast friendship, had died just a year before. <laughs> Um, I've just got back in Ethiopia, and I've wanted to know that um, women um, who also went to the boarding schools that I know are reading your biopic. So it is, it is getting to Ethiopia, people are reading it. And I want to also say that it's a wonderful account. I work in Gondola myself, and, um, and I know the utter, Marianne, and I know the queen, and I remember um, that you mentioned. And this is a beautiful... Um, reconstruction of the, 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 the Ethiopia that's really disappeared since the urban expansion of Ethiopia, the smell of the earth, the smell of the butter, etc, etc. Um, my, my question to you is, um, in terms of the Eleka, um, it, his do you think that his juridical status, his, his legal status, gave your, your grandmother leverage in terms of her petition. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, he, he, he came from a very, very modest background, but he was a scholar and he, um, he was a very, you know, he, he really, he knew everything by heart, partly because there was a kind of, he, there was a curse and he wasn't allowed to write, so he ended up learning everything. And he was a, he was a master of Pliny. Um, actually, he, um, his first encounter with the emperor was him, because he gave one of the Kenny epic coronation in 1930. Personal and personal histories to recognize the family of uh, Stevens and Pippa Sanford, yeah. the, the, the son of uh, the brigadier. And please, would you just say a few words for us? As a great, uh, I can try, but my human frailty is reducing the power of my voice to be heard. My father first went to Egypt. He was at that time stationed in the British military at Aden, and his brother worked in the Sudan. And being a simple-minded fellow, he took a Bermuda and worked out that the shortest way to get to visit his brother was to walk across Ethiopia. And walk across it was, because by that time the railway had barely yet reached to the dark. And uh, he had to rely on camels up as far as that Zabra, and mules beyond that Zabra to complete his journey. He then came back to Ethiopia as British Vice Consul in 1910 until 1913. He then went back to the World War, <coughs> and came back to Ethiopia in 1919 to work in various private enterprises most of which were singularly unsuccessful. <laughs> but he, one of the things he did was become a, a, a correspondent of the Daily Mail newspaper, I think. And he was used by Haile Selassie as a way of getting a better audience and a better image for Ethiopia in the British press. When the Italians started to show signs of invading in 1935, Haile Selassie told my well, the most useful thing he could do would be to go down to Maji and help the governor there in suppressing and cooperating with the British over the suppression of the slave trade. Maji is not particularly easy to get to at the moment, but in those days it took six weeks. <laughs> we then left Ethiopia because of the Italian invasion. I, I claim the time one of the, the first political exiles. <laughs> I left at the age of six months. 
My father then spent a miserable time trying to find work in England, but finally joined the British military intelligence in the Middle East when it became clear that Italy was about to join Germany in the, world, in the war against Britain. My father then spent his time next year trying to persuade various British colonies around Ethiopia that backing Haile Selassie was the simplest thing to do to help Britain join and succeed in the war. My father then led a mission, while well, the Italians were still in control of Ethiopia, led a mission with the German Tsavala to go to the various patriots over Gojo and say to them, Haile Selassie is about to come back. He's going to have the British this time helping him, and now you need to make your contacts with him and receive your instructions from him. And he spent six months in Ethiopia before Haile Selassie returned. He was then appointed Chief Political Military Advisor to Haile Selassie and spent the next two years in re establishing, in helping Haile Selassie re establish his rule. He was called British military and political advisor, and there was at that time considerable tension between the British colonies and the British home government about what should be done about Ethiopia. The colonies said, well, you helped them get independence. We will now instruct them as a protector of Britain to behave properly and develop the right way. And the highest lessons strongly resisted this and was helped by my father. He then spent two years in the Ministry of the Interior as Director General and advisor there in helping to re-establish the pro provincial administrations. In 1946, he ceased to work in the private sector. I'll give you the third I thought I wanted two poems. Um, one is a short one, which is it's about the, 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 the memory of the crowd. What I'm saying is, whatever it did, the good or bad, that there is a significant role the crown, the Ethiopian crown, has played in making the Ethiopia we know today. So nobody, you know, you can defame the crown, the, 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 the kings and the, the princes, but you can never take the history of the history of the of, of Ethiopia. Yeah. So that's the short point that was that was that was Yeah, this is the summary. The goes had a panqua, the bahad the lunas, the kola rega, bahaya the lunas, the let the let no bumit the campus, but no belemada, alwak is the sas, the no zayo telegito by net simo by yalla. And there is the old man by what casket no, and a girl and his and the gatato as man to a gamando, can the unato and his gatato, milk a lot of low to set to the combat, the governance that no wood it will carry nuts, the Namago at the water of the Zamanas water of the soup and get yellow, the Yazo Lutusta, Tari Tari the show, Bowdash, Alatum. ባሁሉም <laughs> I'm sure my Ethiopian audience will, will enjoy it, but uh, it might be boring for uh, you know, uh, my speaking audience. So, have I got another four or five minutes? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a wishful thing, but I'm saying that I'm not just it's a more nostalgia. I'm remembering the days when I grew up as a child, when I was free to move anywhere with Mulu of Paragon, a hall of a bird. 
በሰው ተከፍቼ ታንቱ ሰው ሰው መሳይ ሰው መሳይ ሰው ሆነ ግዜ ካነሳው ጋር ማጨጨል ይወዳል ማሽካበ ከበዛል እጁ መቼ ለርቆት በግሩም ይጨምራል የነፋሱ አጥጣጫ ድንገል ለወጥ ሲል ከነፋሱ ቀድሞ ከተሰበረ ይወደቀ ሲያገኝ ለመገጠም ማለት ነው ይወደድ ነው እንጂ የሚታመን ይፋል ከገንዘብ በስተቀር ያምላክ ስማይ ጠራ ወድን ወድና ጀርባ ነው ከይን ይፈጋራ ንገረን ካልክማ በልን ካተከበል ሰው ከሆነ ከሰው ጋር መኖር ስለማትችል ከንስሳቱ ጎራ እየተከላከለ አወጣ አወጣ ከራሴ ተማከለ ልባው ከወዳጅን እንደሰማው ዘንድ ወጥር እንዲህም ሆነና ከዛ ላይ ጀምሮ ካሁን ይፋሳ ወፍ መሆን ተመኘው ያላን እንዳች ማመንጫት የሄደው የሚመጥ ይሰምን ተዋዛ ቲኬት መቆጠብ ያለ ፓስፖርት ያለ ቪዛ ቶከን ቶከን ታላ ቪዛ ባሻይ ከን ከን ፍየ አየሩን ከስፈ የሱና ቋርጨ ይባሉ ተሻገጠ አገሬ ገባሉ አገሬን ገብቼ የደጋን ቆላ የወና ደጋውስ ካንዱ ወደ ሌላው ሲሻው መዛወር ተነስቶ የሚበር የቀበሌ ነዋሪ መታወቂያ ደብተር ለማውጣት የማይከፍል እጅ እጅ መንሻ ገበር ዮሴ ሳይወጣ የድር የድር የማህበር መቀበሪያ የሚሆን የማይገዛ መሬት አጃቢ ሳይፈልግ የሚያፍ ባገኘበት የሰማይ ቤቱን በር ከከፍቶ የሚያስገባው አርፋ የሚሰጠው ነፍስ አባ ይሄለው የሚያለማው መሬት የሚከፍለው ግብ ንብረቱን ድንበው ድንብረት ድንበው ተባቂ ወጣደ ጉቦ የለመደ ጅጁን የሚያው ጭቃሹ መስለኝ ዳኛ የማይፈልገው ከየት እንደመጣ ወዴት እንደሚል ማንም ሳይጠይቀው መፍራት እንደሚችል ከልቡ ወደ መጣው እንደ ሰማይ ላይ ሆን መኖር እንደሚችል በዚህ ጫ በዚህ ጫ እኔም እኔም ሰኔም እኔም አንበር ደጃት እኔ ያሪ አሞሪ ጨባር ጎደረኛ ነው ቂጣንጋ ካምቤላ ባንጭ ኮንሶ ሳክሎ ወይ ሳክ ሰው ይላ ደመራ ባንፎ ወጋ ባጋሮ ወጋ ቤሳሉ ቱቢት አሶሳ ካማሽን ሳካልሎ ወል መላ መተከል ሰሜን ከሸተተኛ ዶዋ መከሌ ያክሱም ዛላም በሳተ ሰናይ ይላል ልብ የፈከደበት ከልካይ ሳይኖርበት ወልካይ ተገዴ ወይ ሰዲት ማና አለፋ ተቆሳ ደምያ እና ፎገራ ወጃም ደሞ ማርቆስ ባንዳ ዛራ በዳሩል ወራ በድስና ሳይታ ከፈታሪ ጋር መነጋገር ሳይመረ ዝቋላ ወጥ ቼክ መናመጭ ከመናመጭ ጋር ዜጋ መኖር ከገዳሙ መንደር ስሰሊ ስዘሙት ሳመዘክን ባለት ከባለ ከባለው ሼ ሁሴን ከወሎ ሼ ከወሎ ሼ ወጋ መቁጣይ ልጅ ብሰልቢ ይዘብ ድንበር ታስኪትል ከልካይ ሳይኖር ግን ካገራ ሀገር ዘወጥሬ ለመኖር እንዲችል ማንንም ሳልፈራ አንታይ ደምባ ቢዶ ቶ ወል ዚስ ፕሌስ ሳም ነክ ነሽን ለመኖር እንዲችል ማንንም ሳልፈራ ያንዴ በልጅነት ወጣች ነው አቆቋች በሚል አዲስ ተረት አርጎ ያጥያትን አንድ አርጎ ያጥያት ዘውድና ሃይማኖት ስኪና ወጥ ድረስ በሰርቆ ገብተን እንዳለፈው ዘመን ሆነ እንዳደኩበት የዚህ ነው የዚያ ነው ይያሳብ ሳይገባኝ ጎሳና ጎትህን አስመዝግብ ሳይሉኝ የኛ ለክ እንደዚህ አብሎ ሳይፈሩጂ ሁሉ ወቁ ያኔ አይደልተኛ ሳይ ሁሉ ምራሲ ነው ምን ይሁሉ ነው በደረና ማ ዌልካም ካርል
trying to modernize Ethiopia. And I think these are the things that I think he did manage to do, which I um, which come out of book. Actually, incidentally, the first thing that happened when I got there was the Queen's visit. And I went to a very, and a lot of speech street journalists came out of came to. Presumably, the same position was arranged because uh, and he had been to return all the hospitality he received from the, the Queen, you know, way back.
what has happened to that? <laughs> so, um, and, and for, the, for the exhibition we had in the Middle Valley, it was a huge success. In fact, they tend, according to papers, 10,000 people attended it. So, um, that's quite interesting. <coughs> in home areas. Our intention was to create an archive showing the diverse musical styles and talent of the region and we hope this archive would be kept in Arbaminch as part of a locally managed arts and resource centre. Um, but with the Parliamentary Act of 2009 <coughs> leading to the banning of many local associations and freezing their assets, local organisers were unable to stage the festival and among the knock-on effects of this uh, legislation was that our work towards setting up the centre became uh, impossible. Um, however, under new management, the festival was again staged between 2012 and 14, but um, it hasn't been since. Uh, it's my hope that recorded music and films, like the festival itself, are a way to raise awareness uh, about the music more widely and to make these diverse peoples better known and understood uh, both in Ethiopia and internationally. Uh, the songs and dances embody cultural knowledge <coughs> where language fails us through music and dance we may come to know one another better. Well. <laughs>
And then my mother uh, worked with uh, Princess Ruth in the Intergermanic School. And I went to the Nazareth School and the Sanford School, and for a while I got in mission. Um, and, and so I kind of sampled a little bit of the entire spectrum of state schools as, as well as uh, 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 private schools. And of course then this, the Sanford Community School, which was an international school. Um, and I wanted to kind of re reflect on, on, some of these, on some of these issues. And also because I recently uh, did a history of UNICEF in Ethiopia. And through that, I was also looking at some of the history of, of education. And as you know, education and learning in Ethiopia, learning goes, you know, is centuries old. And every community both has its own ways of handing down knowledge, and the literate communities have their own gears and antecedents. So learning, knowledge, transfer is very, very ancient. And it's actually part of our first world, if you kind of look at it that way, because the history is very long. But also the, the issue of, of, of Ethiopians going out to be teachers is also very old. Okay, and you look at Ethiopian history and, and the, the priests who, who, who went to Jerusalem, who, who part of the Coptic, the early Christianity, the, the history of the, of the Ethiopian Jewish community, of Islam, all involved people coming and going and visiting and transferring knowledge. So this is all very, very, very deep. And this is very much aware in the consciousness uh, uh, within, within Ethiopia. And here is where, uh, especially uh, His Majesty, was both very <coughs> proud of the ancient traditions of Ethiopia in all its uh, spectrum, as well as being very keen about modern education and modern technology. And part of you know his sort of going around the world was also to kind of you know bring in recruit teachers uh, <coughs> and, and, and everything. And, and he, he was also very, um, himself, cosmopolitan. I, I don't know if people realize how many languages he spoke and how many languages were spoken in his family. And the Ethiopian elites in general are very, very cosmopolitan and always have been. And, and, and I think one forgets this. Um, and, and, and now it's repeated in, 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 in the diaspora. But, but the, 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 the great knowledge of some, some of them who, especially the priests or whoever who speaks you know, Arabic, Hebrew, uh, French, German, you, you name it. It's, it's a great feeling of cosmopolitanness. And this is again some of the knowledge where people think, oh, Ethiopia buried in history, you know, forgotten by the past, all alone, insular. Actually, in some places maybe yes, but in other places no. They were part of the of the global uh, world and, and still are. So these, these are just some of the things to kind of throw out and, and uh, reflect on. But the, the early 50s and 40s after uh, uh, the emperor came back to Ethiopia, he took a great interest. He was very keen on modernizing the education system and bringing in and opening schools. He founded the university. Part of his coming here was also to kind of expand, you know. And later on, for various reasons, the, the, even though his relatives came here and he had prime ministers who, who came here, and actually the first student to College, the son of Blata Geta uh, Hirui, Sirak Hirui who then went home and translated the book, The uh, Rasselas Prince of Abyssinia. <laughs> and, and his father was also an educated man in the Ethiopian tradition. He was, I think, foreign later. But the, the, the emperor took great interest <coughs> in the students. He, he shepherded them. He went his own family, went to university. All the young ones he sent off, he met them. All the pictures in his uh, own uh, books, you know, you show him, uh, you know, having meeting students and, and, and going to school. And as 
he developed schools around the country, both state schools, and then he, he encouraged missionaries to come in and open schools. And then in, there were various the foreign communities there also opened schools. So there was an Indian school, a French school, a German school, a Swedish school. But they were international schools. They were not schools just for those, those, uh, those communities. The, the, there was no kind of uh, apartheid there. And the other interesting thing about them is they also taught Amharic for those who wanted to, 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 le to learn Amharic. And, and they were very international. But the, the, the secondary schools, uh, as, as they expanded, were, were very, very of uh, interest to, to the emperor, and he would visit most afternoons after he he, he held court and he did the affairs of state. He would go in his car with his little dogs and and members of the family, and he would go and open a school, open a, a, a hospital, a clinic, you know. And you would hear the car with the with the. Captain Shambhan Timo in front, <laughs> very imposing bodyguard, who had whiskers down here. And, and everybody would know, you know. <laughs> and, and, and he would stop, and he would just roll down the window, and, and people would come, and, and he would often give them, you know, money. And, and, and I, I was given five birds once like that. But um, and. And he, he would go over, I mean, to, to the, the provinces in, in those days and, and, and open schools. So he was very, he followed the students. But he was also very personal with those scholars who studied Ethiopia, who had a great interest in Ethiopia. And for example, I think Wendy, was it correct? Edward Ullendorf, the, the first, uh, he, he was given a prize by, by, the, by the emperor. So, Anyone who came to his attention, who supported Ethiopian studies, Ethiopian history, would be personally recognized by him. So he, he had this very, very uh, close and in, in, intense, and he, even though he wanted new things, he was also very proud that people were proud of uh, Ethiopian uh, history. And as the schools expanded, one of the interesting things we hear a lot about the Ethiopian student movement and the involvement of, you know, revolutionaries <coughs> and everything. But and there are more and more young people uh, of the, that generation are now writing their, their own memoirs. And part of the memoirs, apart from the politics side, is also the social side. There's a great nostalgia going on about what it was like being in school. Especially being a boarder, whether it was a Haile secondary school or whether it was the Jigma College or a Kagi mission, because this was where young people from the rural areas met kids from the town. This is where, if you were from Watlaka, you met someone, you know, from from uh, Addis Ababa, or you went to school. So people were mixing with each other, and these schools have a kind of memory of, 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 you know, a lovely time, sheltered, protected, where, where you studied, you learned. And it was a time where also you, you, you were uh, thinking in different ways. There were all different kinds of, of teachers. They were recruited uh, from, from Europe, from India. Uh, and then the Peace Corps came. The Peace Corps had a tremendous influence and you can go down the street with an old Peace Corps, and I, I can tell you num numerous stories. And he may be called Jim, or David, or Samantha, and they may be gray-haired, and they may be bald, and they may have, you know, changed shape from when they were in, the, in, the, in there in the 60s. And you walk around Dese, or somewhere, or Jimma, and someone will come and say, it was a great time. I think mm. some of the, you know, the nostalgia is, is, is around, uh, around all of these things. But then, of course, part of the learning was the questioning. Part of the discovery of themselves in Ethiopia was also 
discovering, you know, the history, the poetry, and, and that's what kind of, you know, got the movement going and, and, and you know, <coughs> led, led eventually to, to the great student uh, movement, but also in terms of, you know, both now it's being questioned, <coughs> illusion, disillusion, but there were also many students who weren't part of the, of the, of the movement. I mean, we hear those who were, but there were many students who simply studied and left and, and, and were, you know, they may have been a part of it in thinking, you know, but they weren't very, very active. But anyway, we will hear more about their stories as they, they write their history. But I think the, the, the main issue was, was to sort of think of those days of a very personal um, patronage you know, of a leader, and are also the students themselves who are very nationalistic. My father passed away two years ago, and um, age 19, and I said to him, Dad, what was the greatest thing you remember about being in Ethiopia? And he said, oh, those students. They were the brightest, <laughs> the sharpest, and they may have argued and quarreled and fought with each other on interpretations of politics or history. But my God, they loved Ethiopia. So you know that, that was, that's kind of uh, of, of a tribute. <coughs> anyway, so nowadays part of as I say part of the nostalgia, and I know there are, all of you have been students here, so you you can share you can share your your, your stories. But there's a great. Literature coming out now. Memoirs are coming out in Amharic, in Oromiya, in different languages, and, and more and more people are, are writing, and, and we're all everyone is reflecting, you know, who they were, what they were. But there's also that nostalgia of the the, the age of perfection. Schooling nowadays, there are many many strikes. Um, lots of people are going to school. There are many schools. There are there are schools. Languages are being taught, and there have been a lot of development, and it's a very expansive. At the same time, there's also feeling that, that, that it's, it's, it's not good enough. But I think that is, that is what development, and you know, we will see what happens. But the point is that now, where there were no schools, where there were no roads, the roads, you know, there's been a lot of changes. And one of the research that is taking place in Oxford uh, by two groups. One is at the uh, School of International Development. There's a study called Young Lives. And this is taking a 20 uh, year perspective of the changes that have happened here for Ethiopian, uh, or Ethiopian youth. There's another group, uh, an NGO, uh, where uh, Anula Pankhurst works uh, also, which is doing uh, another 20 year retrospective of. 20 communities in Ethiopia. And again, working with researchers in different universities in Ethiopia, spanning all the different economic, livelihood, educational changes. And, and uh, so there's lots of interesting uh, things going on. And, and also, you know, people are debating, okay, how is the youth, you know, how do we compare the youth? What is their ideology today? From what it was yesterday. How do they link? How strong was the activist movement uh, to this new activist movement? You know, what is the role of music? Uh, lots of interesting research going on on, on, on music uh, as a way of, of uh, uh, rethinking Ethiopian history and the young ideology ideologues of, of today. But anyway, it was just to, to give a flavor of that and, and to to, to uh, remind ourselves of the very personal, uh, personal uh, interest, and there's a whole generation who, who do remember, you know, actually a visit uh, uh, of the of the emperor, and, and and even though the kind of the love affair fell out after a while, there's, there's still that, that memory of Timur Nagarajan and the wanting of. So this is just what I, I wanted to share with you.